Welcome back to the Over Comfort Podcast, you guys. I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you so much for watching and listening wherever you guys are at. Um, and for all the support that you guys have given, I am so grateful and thankful. I can't believe we're starting the new year off with a great start, uh, personally and on Over Comfort. Today's guest is one of my closest friends, best friend, Isaac. He, Jay, baby. You, guys, <laughs> you guys may not know, but Isaac used to be my roommate until he left me. And wow. we're not going to get into wow. details of that because it still hurts. I'm just joking. Um, but I wanted to talk about calling over comfort. And I chose Isaac and Val's here as well um, to talk about this topic because to, to, to discuss this topic. Because Isaac and Val both moved from Miami. Um, and it's a dramatic change. It's a lot. It's a huge risk to just completely move your life. And it doesn't have to be in relationships. I mean, it doesn't have to be in, in like moving from city. It could be in your relationships. Like what is calling over comfort? And for me, I've always stood by that. Isaac knows. Val knows. Um, I believe that calling over comfort is really just choosing your higher, greater power, your higher purpose that God, God has called you for to, um, and leaving your comfort zone. Like, I feel like it's so important. I feel like you got to do that. Val got to do that. And you guys have like expanded and like have evolved so greatly. Um, so yeah. Tell me about your story, Isaac. Tell Jay, the people. Baby, we in the <laughs> Billy. Uh, disclaimer, I was Jenica's first roommate ever. That's for true. sure. That's true. We spent an amazing what? It was like a year, ten months. That not a year and ten months. It was a year, ten like months. Ten months, basically, yeah, because I left in uh in August, but it was an amazing time. <laughs> but you know, uh, your boy became a man and you know he grew his own wings and it was time for me to fly and you did. But I'm here so honestly be because of you and um, you know, I love you so much and thank you for having me. I'm excited to, to talk about, you know, going over our comfort, choosing mm -hmm. purpose um, and our calling as yeah. as the um, the mantra of over comfort. Yep. But yeah, I'm excited to get into detail about that more. Yeah, I'm excited um, because the time that we lived together, we had a lot of deep, not a lot, but we had a good amount of deep conversations over some hookah or <laughs> we have a little For drinkity sure. drink in our system. A thousand percent. Um, Isaac moved from Maryland to Miami mm -hmm. with his family, right? Yeah. He has like a family of six. Got a big family. Big family like me. Very big. From Miami, he moved over here by himself to LA. A thousand percent. In search of what? In search of, well, it's hard to, I guess, to put it into one word, but... In all honesty, if I could, you know, make a long story short, it's, yeah, I guess like the whole mantra of overcomfort, which was I finally put myself first in my life and choosing my calling, choosing my purpose or what I felt drawn to uh, my whole entire life. And that's pursuing fashion, that's pursuing styling. And, um, you know, for a very long time, I wasn't sure if I was capable of that. Mm -hmm. But I had other people tell me I was, mm -hmm. but I couldn't really, you know, realize it until we went to uh, Baja Fest. Uh -huh. um, and we wild. spent an amazing weekend in Baja <laughs> Fest. Yo, Baja Fest, invite us again <laughs> because that shit was amazing. Yeah, it was it a was vibe. Great. We had an amazing time. Um, and during that time, a little backstory so you guys can kind of like get some context as far as like how I even got here. So during that time, I was going through a lot, a lot of depression, a lot of anxiety. Um, my current or my career back then was I was trying to be a loan officer. So I was in the mortgage industry in all honesty, just for money, to be honest, like just to, you know, finally find a career yeah, to survive, to find a career where I could, you know, eventually get married. Uh, you know, buy a house, the American dream, you know, have a car, you know, have the white picket fence and all that. But there was like something inside of me, inside of my heart that I knew it wasn't bringing me any sort of fulfillment and honesty. So 
you know, at the time I was living with my parents and I was making good money where, you know, I could, you know, do whatever I want, you know, um, go take out my, my girlfriend at the time out to eat, buy her things, take her out on trips, buy myself things, um, go to the club, do anything I pretty much wanted. You know, I was so comfortable, but as time grew on and it lingered more and more, there was just something in my heart that I knew was like, man, there is nothing that is kind of like filling this emptiness that I feel in, inside of my heart. Um, it just got really bad where I would have anxiety attacks at random times of the day. I would, I didn't want to get up every morning. It was just like such a drag. It was so, um, it just like felt like I was living my life with, as a burden, you know, living out of obligation of like, I have to do this for a paycheck. I have to do this in order to survive, like you said. And, you know, from, I was just kind of like seeking some sort of like, I don't even know what, like how to put it because I just didn't know what to do. I just felt stuck in all honesty. I was just like, man, like I just have to see this through being a loan officer because, you know, this is my way out, my way out of my parents' house, my way to get married, to, you know, have a family. And it felt like I reached a dead end in my life where I was like, all right, this is it. This is pretty much how my life is going to, I'm going to be Isaac, the loan officer, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And you guys knew like my whole process and to the point where I was like, all right, I'm going to, you know, commit to, you know, this career, commit to my girl and do all this stuff. And we had planned um, with my girlfriend at the time for her birthday to go to um, Baja Fest wow. and then go to L.A. later. And then that's when we go to Baja Fest. After we had a, you know, we go to Baja Fest, we come back to L.A. You forgot to say that it was all I felt like it was also God at that time when you couldn't pass the test. Oh, yes. So to become a loan officer, to get the license, you need to take this. Um, this is basically an exam that you have to take and you have to get a certain score to pass. Just like when you real estate or, you know, insurance license, you have to, you know, obviously pass the exam mm -hmm, in order to become mm -hmm. certified, all that. So I was studying my, like, I you couldn't were. believe the position that I was in. You like, were. I was like, I hated school. I knew school was not for me. But I needed to pass this test to go to like the next level and even make more money right. and to be officially called a loan officer. Mm -hmm. So I tried the first time, failed it. And I was like, oh, no, you know, I didn't really study. Bunch of bullshit. The second time I take it and then I fail it again. And I'm like, nah, bro, I'm just in my head. I'm just a horrible test taker <laughs> to where my boss flies me out to where the company was at right. in Maryland, my home state. She had me there for a whole month to right. like study, learn, ask her questions. Uh -huh. And then to when I got back home to take the test again, because I was going to get a license in, in Florida. So when I get back to Florida, I'm like, nah, I'm good. I spent a whole month like learning with this lady. This is it. This is my moment. I'm going to pass and I'm going to be set for the rest of my life. This is what I'm going to do. Then I fail it again. And then I have to wait six. So once you fail it three times, you have to wait six months to take it again. So after I failed it that last time, I was just like, nah, I'm fucked. Like, I'm screwed. But that's when me and Val told you, we're like, bro, that's not for you. That's not what your life is about. Just come on. Yeah, was it, stubborn uh, for a yeah, honestly, <laughs> honestly, I was so discouraged. And I think that was another thing that kind of played into my whole, like, depression and, and feeling anxiety. Because it was just kind of like, yo, what I felt it like lowered I, your self esteem a thousand percent. I just want to give a quick shout out to myself, <laughs> <laughs> Valerie. You know, always encouraging me, always like trying to drag me to LA from the start from years ago. She dragged everybody to LA, no, a thousand percent. But, but no, I get it. It lowered your self esteem. Yeah. It, like you felt like, what else, what else am I supposed to do? Yeah, because I can honestly say, like, I gave it my all, mm -hmm. like, I tried my best, and it just felt like. I couldn't study anymore. I couldn't read anymore. I couldn't do any more to pass this freaking test. And I was just like, that's where I kind of like fell at that dead end. I was just like, damn, I got to wait six months to pass this. And it just kind of like lingered more and more in my, like my sorrow, my sadness just deepened and deepened and it, it affected my relationship, my friendships, you know, even relationships with my family and obviously, like you said, my self-confidence, my self-esteem to even in Baja Fest where it would just be like moments where I'm like, I'm having fun and I'm like, yo, this is live. This is, you know, fire. And then there would be like 
an instant where I'll just be like, but damn, bro, I got to go back home and I got to go back to reality and I'm going to be the, yeah. the failure and how I felt. Like the failure couldn't pass the test. The guy who had no direction, the guy that in reality, like I'm being, a, I'm trying to be in the loan officer to, you know, get something, you know, accomplished in my life. But in reality, that's not what I want to do. Right. So fast forward to where we come back to LA and a funny story when like days leading up to that, uh, to the days when we were flying out to LA with you guys, I was just like, man, God, if you give me like an opportunity to get out of this, I don't know how, but I'll take that risk. Mm -hmm. And that's just something that I kept repeating in my head. I don't think I ever told you guys, but obviously Valerie was always encouraging me, but I was like, nah, like, I'm just not sure. Like she does that with everybody. Like, am I just another person that she Mm -hmm. wants to bring Mm -hmm. out to LA? Obviously I know she always believed in me, but I just didn't want to do it because everyone else was doing it. Like I really was like, man, I have to feel this call, this conviction to actually take that step, whether if it's LA or uh, maybe another opportunity. Of course. So Baja Fest passes, we come back to LA and it was like maybe like a couple of days from my flight back to Miami. And then you sit me down and you have a talk with me and it's Valerie, you, me, uh, my ex-girlfriend at the time. Mm-hmm. And you're like, I, I want to help you. What are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? What are you doing with your life? I want to help you. You need to move out here. You're wasting your time in Miami. Um, I want to give you this opportunity. I want to help you out. And to me, I was just like, I was kind of shook because Mm -hmm. I was just like, damn, this is exactly what I told God I wanted from him, to be honest. Like, this is exactly what I, the sign that I kind of was like looking for. And in that moment, I was just like, when you guys were talking in my head, I was like, nah, I got to do this. It it took like no hesitation. I was like, I got to do this. No, even then you still went back home. You're like. I'm going to think about yeah. it. I got to see. And, and the only reason because of that is what I told you yeah. when we spoke about it was like, I never wanted something to get in between our relationship. You know, our friendship was the first, like first place in my heart, you know, and I wanted to make sure that my intention was, or my heart was in a good place before I even accepted anything from you. Cause I even thought about like, Oh, what is your family going to think about this? Like, mm-hmm. oh, Isaac's moving in, a guy, like he's 20 yeah. years old. And is he taking advantage of her? Right, is he right, like, right. What, what are his intentions? And there were so many factors that I like came into mind at the moment where I was just like, man, you know, I want to make sure that if I am doing this, I'm not taking advantage of you. That, you know, I, I'm going to put our friendship first, that I'll never let money or attention or fame or mm-hmm. whatever bullshit like social media like get in the way of that. Because of at the end of the day, as long as I get to be have some sort of relationship with you, as long as, you know, we can always talk to each other. And that was my first priority. So obviously I went back home and in my heart, it was just like, man, this is the moment. But I was like, nah, I got to take time and I got to think about this before I actually do anything. But I knew right away in my heart, like this was, it was like that defining moment of like, all right, are you going to choose your calling over your comfort? Yeah. Because back home I was comfortable. I had money and I had, a, you know, good money in my bank account. I had a girl. I had amazing friends. I had a beautiful family. I was living with my parents. So I was chilling. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't really lack anything in my life. I was just, you know, very sad and, you know, I had no direction in my life. But when you when you offered me to to move in with you, I was just like, nah, this is it. This is the opportunity that, you know, for some reason God put in your heart, which is... It like insane to even think about, you know, your generosity, your kindness mm-hmm. changed my life, which is something that is, you know, that I think about in hindsight, I'm like, man, I, I don't know what God did or how he spoke to you or why he even spoke to you to give or uh, to tell you to give me this opportunity, but it changed my life completely. <laughs> A thousand percent. Oh, you guys. <laughs> Yeah. No, the thing is, is that I I'll always tell you and I always tell Val, like, my ultimate goal in life is to really help, help people, like, bless them. Like, if I see a vision and I see purpose, like, I'm going to help you reach for it. And, like, that's what I saw through you. And yeah. I'll, I, I'll tell you a thousand times again, and it's like... I could be hurt over and over again about him moving out, but, <laughs> like, the fact that he did, like... 
it goes again like you're taking the risk because you had you like you're taking a risk again yeah and it's it doesn't like again you had you had you know everything with your parents and then you had you know the roof over your head at my house and then it's like you're moving on and it's like you don't want to ever get comfortable and it's like if you stay in that comfort like you're just not gonna to move along and Isaac decided he's like you know what I'm gonna go ahead and move out of Miami I'm gonna move out of Jay's and go and really pursue his styling like and right now you got, it took him a while like me and Val talk about it so many times like we cannot believe like and the times you were at home were like dude guess what I got this job dude I got this job and it's like how insane like God really works and it's like you won't ever know until you take that risk a thousand percent and um and yeah, did you, how did you cope when you moved? Like from, cause okay, from Maryland to Miami, you had your family. Yeah. That wasn't that hard, was it? It, it was, in the beginning, it wasn't hard, but then in the middle, it was the, the hardest part. Like you wanted to go home. Oh, not necessarily that. It was like my parents struggled financially. So when my parents moved to Miami was to go to the church um because me and my brothers were kind of like wilding out mm -hmm. we were like drinking partying and all this stuff now that i think about it, I'm like it wasn't really that bad but <laughs> growing up christian my parents thought we were like going to hell we're going to like right. we're heathens right now we're like drinking partying we're sneaking out the house so my parents decided not like the crazy story i don't want to get into this a long story about like how you know god moved us over there but we move up to miami and my parents parents didn't have a job over there they had a bunch of savings we moved into this house wow. and they were like all right we're gonna figure it out um but we feel called you know to be in miami risk. so the first i want to say couple months was good until my parents couldn't get employed they ran out of money they couldn't pay rent anymore we got evicted moved into a hotel then it was Dude, um wild. it was seven of us so my mom my dad and then my siblings in a hotel room with two beds and it was like one of those hotel rooms that has like a kitchen and all that. And you pay like on a two week basis. Right. So eventually my dad got employed through Walmart and he was working overnight. So wow. he would uh, work overnight to pay like the hotel for us to, you know, stay there. Then they end up bumping into this family that was like, hey, get out of the hotel, move in with us in this townhouse that it was like a three room. Wow. Like you, they, they were a small family. So it was like uh, a wife, uh, a husband, and then their little boy. And they were like, oh, and you guys can rent out the, the other two rooms for the same amount. And you guys will have more space because you guys will have access to the whole townhouse. So we did that. We moved into the townhouse with another family. Mm -hmm. We stayed there for, I want to say, about a year. And then my dad got a new job working for this AC company, which is where he is now. He's like one of the managers there. Right. And, you know, we were finally able to get our own house, like a townhouse, which where my parents are still now. And... I want to say it was like a good three to four years where we were just struggling a lot wow. where, you know, we like I first got introduced to the, like food stamps when in Miami. I grew wow. up my whole like my parents or my family in Maryland. We were good. Like we had a three story home. My dad was making over 100K a year, like straight. I had no idea what poverty was. We moved to Miami. Like, my mom was like, oh, I applied for food stamps. I'm like, what the fuck is food stamps? Right. Like, oh, the government gives us money to buy food. I'm like, that's a real thing. Like, right. I thought it was insane. Like, right. we even got the little cell phone that they provide if we needed it. So there was so much shit that, you know, in a way, look, hindsight, kind of looking at things, I'm like, that's honestly kind of what prepared me going through that mm -hmm. to kind of take this risk and be like, all right, we went through that as a family and we figured it out. And now my dad and my family is in a good position. They don't no longer lack or struggle how they did before. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, all right, if I went through that, I can pretty much go through anything. I'm like, we got evicted. I lived in a hotel with my whole family. You knew what struggle yeah, was. Already. I knew what struggle was. I know what it was to have essentially nothing and relied on the government every month to, you know, have mm -hmm. put food on the table. So with that, it just kind of like prepared me mentally even subconsciously in a way where I just kind of knew, Hey, I'll figure it out at the end of the day because I've done that before and I'll continue to do that for the rest of my life. So now, you know, present day, or let's say when I first moved over here, it was hard. Yeah, Honestly, it was hard. So when I was, I was still, I kept a part-time 
with the other mm-hmm. mortgage company where we agreed to work a couple hours throughout the week. And then, I forgot about that. yeah, work a Saturday. So I flew all my equipment. Um, well, shout listen. out Amy real quick. Shout yeah, out shout Amy. Out, yo, Amy from Direct Mortgage Loans. Amy Wolf, we shout love out to Amy. you. We, uh, we love Amy and, and her Lauren. wife. <laughs> and her wife too. Yo, shout out Amy's wife. She's amazing. They're a beautiful family, honestly. Oh She's God. very generous. Dude, I love I her so much. I forgot about that, that you had that job. Yeah, the crazy part is that I had put in a, a month notice and I told her, I'm like, oh, I'm going to quit. I'm moving to LA. Right. And I was like, I'm just going to figure it out. And then she was like, okay. Like, she's she was very sad. Like, they uh-huh. wanted to keep me on board. Mm-hmm. But I was like, no, I'm, I'm going to leave. And then I <laughs> want to say the week um, when I was going to move to L.A. Right. So when I came back from L.A. to Miami, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I want to say like three days after I told you, okay, I'm going to move. Right. And I bought my ticket. I was like, I know this is something that I have to commit and pull the trigger right away. Or else I'm going to back out. October 9th. Yeah, this October is 9th is when I when I flew over here. So September 9th is pretty much when I had everything all set. And I was like, no, nah, I'm moving to LA. Fuck it. I told my family I'm doing it. I'm not looking back. I bought my ticket. about my ex-girl's ticket. She was coming with me. We we went on Southwest because you could take four luggages for free. Oh a carry-on. So we filled all that shit up. Or a check-in bag. I filled all that shit up with my clothes. Then I had to fly. Or going back to the other story. So I'm kind of like flip-flopping. But... So Amy, the week before moving to L.A., she was like, hey, how about we try out you doing part time work a couple hours a week? Because I was the only Spanish speaker at the company, which is why they wanted to keep me Uh, because I was the only one that was able to speak to their Spanish clients. And then when she was like and work the weekends and you'll have some you know, money and we'll be flexible with your schedule. Because I assume, like, yo, I'm going to move to L.A. and I'm going to be Mr. Stylus, Mr. Fashion. I'm going to be Jerry Lorenzo. I'm going to be you know, in yeah. like in the scene type mm-hmm. of shit. And I just didn't know how it worked. So when I moved out here, I agree with Amy to keep the part time, which thank God that I did because it kind of like kept me alive, you, really you did. know, with with what I needed to pay because, hey, I moved, but you still maybe right. pay rent, mm-hmm. which is something that, of course, like, you know, it makes sense. So it's not like, oh, you gave me a free handout and I was just there chilling in the house, you know, doing whatever I wanted. I still have some sort of responsibility and especially if I wanted to, you know, make moves in the industry that I was, you know, trying to, to find my way in, I knew I needed to keep myself afloat. So I kept my part time. I was doing that on the weekends at 7 a.m. in the morning because the company I worked for was on the East Coast. So there were three hours ahead. So I have to wake up 7 a.m. in the morning every Saturday Work whatever eight hours. It would be mostly like I want to say. And still film your content, remember? Yeah, I was d- doing my reels nonstop, which <laughs> helped me out and gave me my start. <laughs> so I would do reels during the week. I would work part time for Amy, and then I started to do Uber Eats too. You're right. I started to do Uber You're Eats right. for I want to say a couple months. So I was doing all these things to you know just kind of keep to the live. dream. So mm-hmm. yeah, to survive and keep the dream alive because. I was like, I, my mentality and all this was, all right, Jay gave me an opportunity. My family, you know, I, I left them and I want to make them proud. Like even now, you know, to this point that I'm doing what I'm doing and I'm here in this position. My thing has always been all right, my career and what I'm accomplishing is not even for me. Like, it's cool that I'm doing all this. I'm happy. I'm content. I feel fulfilled. But I'm like, it's more for my friends. It's more for right. my family to be like. Yo, you know what? He took a risk and he's making us proud. And even to tell like your children later on, like a thousand percent. I think it's so inspiring. And the next I wanted to ask both of you, Val, um, because, you know, you guys left your family and I ultimately want to take the risk. I've talked about it with you to move to Miami, you know, Mm -hmm. for a bit like Uh. That was our promise to each other, but now you want to stay to LA, but that's fine. <laughs> no, I, but you were going to leave me to go to Miami and leave my ass back here in no. LA. And you were going to go with Val. That's what was going to happen. I Val just have... was going to stay. Val's ah, still deciding if she cap. wants to stay or not. That's cap. Um, no, but I do want to take that risk, but it is it is hard because, you know, you grew up with a big family. I have a big family. Yeah. And Val has a big family, too. So you being out here, what has kept you motivated despite, and the question is for both of you guys, what has kept you guys motivated despite the adversity? Because Val, you went through a very hard two years in LA, 
You hated it. So what's kept you motivated? Check, check. Is this thing on? It's on. <laughs> what was the question again? Oh my God, this what is crazy. What kept you motivated, G? Actually, what's kept you motivated? Um, I feel like what's kept me motivated is the fact that I came out here because God told me to come out here. It wasn't like a decision that I made because I was bored or like, man, LA was cool. I actually hated LA. So I think that was my biggest thing that I just like, I knew that I had to come here for a reason and it was because God told me to. So I just wasn't going to let no matter. I mean, you know how hard it was, but Mm -hmm. I just knew that I had to be out here. Like I just knew. And whether that, whether I thought, I I feel like I had a, like a, a image of what I thought God wanted me to do out here. And it ended up being like completely different. And, even hearing Isaac talk again just reminds me, like, even him being out here could be part of the reason why God brought me out here, you know? <clears throat> so I feel like that's the biggest thing that's kept me here. Like, even though I've wanted to go back probably, like, 27 times a month, but I've grown to love it. I love it. And I don't know. Now I'm, like, even praying about if I should move back just because I just feel like my life is here now. And I don't know. It's just. Do you feel like now that you're comfortable here, do you feel like you have to take the risk of moving back? Because what if now you're comfortable here and That's you don't want to question you don't want to get out? That could be. Yeah. I mean, ideally, at least obviously people don't know this, but at least like I moved out here with this, I would say, idea that not idea, but like, you know, I had a God spoke to me and told me be in L.A. for at least five years. Mm-hmm. I make five years in March. So I don't want to like pressure myself and be like, all right, you completed your five years. Time to go. Pack it up. Right. But I also don't want to be comfortable either, which I feel like in my life, I don't know that answer yet. I don't know if I'm comfortable or not. I feel like I am because I am very comfortable. Uh, mood, there you answer your own question. <laughs> I know. Mood, answer my question. But I don't I don't know if it's like maybe I need to take the risk out here in L.A. to something else or maybe it's not Miami. I've always had to like I've always had this like thought of like moving to Atlanta, too. Mm. But I'm probably never going to move to Atlanta. Until like I'm fifty, and buy a house, have three kids. I don't know, but fifty. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Damn, yeah, girl. 50. Yeah. Hey, Chad Beach says better at seventy. Hey, so money, better 50. at seventy. You're risking it. Oh man. my god. What about you, Isaac? What keeps me motivated? I think I just have this obsession of like wanting to be the best version of myself because I know the best version of me mm. has everyone in mind. Like, when I do this, and it's just what I was telling you, like, when I'm doing what I'm doing, like, the fact that I've been successful, that I've been able to do, like, fashion or styling full-time now, is more just, like, to eventually put me in a position where I can put other people on. Like, what you did for me, I have that longing to, you know, whether if it's my family, whether if it's friends, whether if it's people that I love or that I believe in, you know, to give them that opportunity that was given to me. So I just have this obsession of like, man, why I've become obsessed with like going to the gym, why I've been a workaholic, why I have been, you know, reading books or watching podcasts, Um, what keeps me going, what, you know, makes me, you know, to the point where I'm like, it's just been like such a crazy turnaround because I went from not wanting to get up in the morning to like, I, I can't wait to start my day. Yeah. I can't wait to get up. I can't wait to get to work i can't wait to talk to people Mm. and build new relationships and it's just been you know i have so much hope i see such beauty in this world now where it's like i went from having a black and white gray type of life to where i now see the color in my life where and i see like you know the flowers and and the beauty i think it's because now you appreciate like i think we could all appreciate how long it took us to get here like like, it's like, wow, it's finally here. And it's like, <sighs> like, I'm yeah. doing what I've been wanting to do. And it's like, yeah. even then you crave more. A thousand percent. Like, you still want, like, you don't know what's next, but you want, you're going to keep going. A thousand percent. And um, the way that you guys, you know, I'm lucky to, like, have known you guys. And I really, I don't want to, I, I give a lot of credit to both of you guys because, Isaac, you really helped me in a time where I was really, like, confused. 
when you lived in Miami and like we would FaceTime all the time and we were going through our little <laughs> breakup sessions. We were just like, but because of you and because of Val, I had the guts to leave a relationship that I no longer belonged in. Yeah. And I can literally say like that relationship held me back for, from so much. And now that, like, because I had the advice from you guys and, you know, obviously myself, like I ultimately made, the, made the decision and it's something that I wanted to do as well. Like I knew, and it doesn't, again, like that's why I'm uh, reiterating that it doesn't have to be like people wanting to move. It could just be a risk of leaving a certain person. A thousand percent. Because even then you, you had to go through something with your ex as well. Yeah. And then what happened? Like, it's just a different story now for you. Of course. And like, or Val, certain friendships. And for me, it was like that specific relationship. I was in a relationship for seven years. And it's like, after I left, like everything changed. Like I knew what I wanted. I got better. I went to the gym. I started doing things for myself. And then I took the risk. I went back to Miami and I went, I got prophesied to. And like, that's where over comfort came. And it like, it just made sense to me, like where my life was going. Yeah. And even now, like, I don't know where it's going, but I'm literally trusting God by yeah. the hand of God. Yeah. Like, and I think we all are. And like, whoever's watching and, you know, we're very faith based here. Like, yeah. we're <laughs> like, you don't have to be, if you're watching, you don't have but. to, but that's why we keep mentioning God. Like we really like, I owe we, I think we all owe a lot to what God has planned for us and our purpose. And I do want to say like, if, if, if there's anybody struggling with their purpose, Isaac, what advice would you give them? I think, um, you just need to kind of like do a self-awareness check or self-reflection, which is what I needed to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think, the most important thing, especially despite what age you're at, to be honest, because it like I even if you are you feel like you're old and you feel like, man, my life is kind of like over or I already kind of like lived my life. You just have to kind of like change your mindset and do a self-reflection of like, all right, am I having the right thoughts? Do I have the right people around me? Mm -hmm. Do important. am I being proactive? Am I being intentional with my life? Because that's one of the things that I mentioned before, which was like I was living my life out of obligation and out of not out of conviction. Yeah. I was doing things because I had to do them instead of I get to do them. Right. And if you feel like, man, but there's no meaning to my life. Like one of the things that people don't realize is that humans have the ability to give things meaning. Yeah. And what I mean by that is like I'm pretty sure you have things from, let's say, your mom mm -hmm. that have so much meaning to you. That to me, you know, may not mean anything because I never had that relationship. Right. But to you, if you lost that, it would hurt inside. Mm -hmm. And it could be a letter. It could be a picture. But it's because you gave that meaning. Mm -hmm. So it's like we have that ability as humans to create our future and to give things meaning. So, hey, if you hate your job, maybe you should leave your job and find something that you actually want to do. Or maybe you should do your job and be the best at it and then find something on the side mm -hmm. that you feel like brings fulfillment and gives you purpose, which is what I was doing, which was like, hey, I was a loan officer and I hated it. But then I would do my reels. I would fill content. I would, you know, post pictures on Instagram and I had fun doing that. You know, every Sunday or plan out every week, I'm like, no, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And it's going to be fire. It's going to be amazing. Or even say when I moved here, I was like, man, I don't want to do fucking Uber Eats. Mm -hmm. Like, do five hours to fucking, you know, drive around and deliver food or work for Amy and, you know, do the wake up Saturdays early in the morning and, you know, do a bunch of stuff that in reality, I felt like brought no meaning, but I understood, Hey, you know what? This is going to play into the part of the bigger picture. Right. And I knew if I was intentional with my life, I knew if I made the best out of every day and understanding that, Hey, you know what? We don't have control over everything in our lives, but what we do have control over, I got to maximize that. Right. So it's like, if you're trying to find your purpose or if you feel lost or if you feel like you don't have direction, number one, you know, kind of ask yourself the hard questions that we don't want to, you know, ask ourselves, which is like, am I wasting my days? Yeah. Am I having negative thoughts? Do I have the wrong people around me? And, you know, alluding back to, to what you're saying, like, Choosing calling over your comfort doesn't mean that you have to move across the country. It doesn't mean that you need to quit your job and chase a career. Yeah. 
if that's what you feel like you have to do, then a thousand percent do it. But if you feel like, hey, you know what? I'm in a toxic relationship and I need to leave that and I need to, you know, prioritize myself, then that's choosing your calling over your comfort. You know, if you feel like, hey, I need to quit my job and pursue my business full time, right. that's choosing your calling over your comfort. If you have something to, you know, you where you want to open your business or you want to go to the gym, as long as you're becoming better, then I feel like you're prioritizing that and you're being intentional and you start to like see the change little by little because success isn't something that help happens overnight. Like before I got to this position where I am now, where I'm with an agency, where I, you know, I have a full week's booked of like working with brands and stuff like that. You know, I had maybe like one or two jobs coming in, at, you know, assisting and, and stuff like that, where I'm just like, all right, man, you know, like I get to do this is fun, but then I got to go work part time again. I got to do Uber Eats to keep this afloat. And it's just kind of like, I got to do what I got to do. But it's in the mundane. It's in the things that you do every single day of your life. When you, If you're intentional, yeah. that it starts to accumulate. And then from one day to another, or a couple months down the road, you're just like, wow, I'm in a way better position than I was a couple months ago. For sure. And I ultimately, like as cliche as it sounds, it's like trusting your gut. Yeah. Trusting your gut and really living your life honestly like yeah. isaac always says save nothing for the next life a thousand and percent. i love that he has it tatted <laughs> tat on me. um but thank you guys so much for listening and watching to the overcomfort podcast isaac thank you so much for of joining us Can i, I love having a last couple words oh my god I don't go. cry yes um no thank you so much for having me here <laughs> baby J. I i love you i'm so proud of you thank you for having fingers. me again um mm. no nah, honestly i'm just so proud of the person that you're becoming uh you know you. from where i from from the time where i first moved to see you now there's like such a big growth that you know i can even sense it where it's like you're just becoming a better person overall you're maturing you're glowing and Thank honestly you. as a friend and someone who cares for you i'm honestly just so so proud and so honored to to have witnessed this and you are that work of art now. Remember the remember yes. our little thing that we had on our on our vision board we last would, year. We would have quotes on the on the whiteboard in the house. Or it's, what but you it remember say? what it said? It said, "Um, I am the artist." No, no, you are the art. What is no. it? No, you are a work of art and an artist at work. There you go, you guys. So words, wise words from my ex roommate. <laughs> no, but really, no, thank you, forever roomie. I know, forever. Um, thank you guys so much again for watching and listening to the Overcomfort Podcast. If you guys want more on this topic or more inspiration, please let us know in the comments below. Make sure you guys subscribe to the Overcomfort Podcast. Um, Isaac, he has pages. Can you want to share your socials? Yeah, um, Isaac made you look on Instagram yeah. um, and on TikTok. And Fit Manager Isaac on TikTok. He definitely made me look. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out Val's world. That's uh, me, Val's world in the building. Val's you know the world. vibes. I love you, Jay. I freaking love you. Um, I love you, Isaac. Thank you, you guys again for joining and for having a real conversation with us. Make sure you guys subscribe, subscribe. follow the Overcomfort podcast, and stay tuned for next Thursday and let us know what other topics you guys want to hear and what other guests. I'll see you guys later. Peace.